So, so welcome to the Uktlich, which means Uktlich, which I've just learned today, which means excellence in, in Hindi, yeah. impact bond, or what I've you know, typically thought about as the, the India Health Impact Bond. This is a very exciting session. My name is Zach Levy. I'm from the Book Impact Labs. I'm here moderating, both very excited but also a bit jealous because this is a topic that for many years when I was working on impact bonds at the IDB, I'd wanted to do. And when I learned about this, I was like, wow, this is really incredible and really something that could really inform the sector. Um, so let me quickly introduce my panelists. Um, we have Peter Vanderwall from Palladium. We have Priya Sharma, Sharma from USAID and Sitsi Wooders from um, UBS. So let's just maybe kick it off. And Priya, could you maybe just give the audience a quick summary of why I'm so excited about this, this impact bond and what's you know, really cool and unique about it? Sure. So it's, a, it's an impact bond. It's a development impact bond focused on improving the quality of care in private health facilities in the state of Rajasthan, specifically around labor and delivery. So um, in global health, a leading cause of maternal and neonatal mortality usually happens around sort of that 48-hour period when a woman delivers um, a baby. And there are a number of different causes of maternal and neonatal mortality. Some of the most common ones are postpartum hemorrhage, so bleeding after delivery and not having the right medicine that is needed to be able to stop that bleeding. Neonatal resuscitation, so a baby born with asphyxia or not breathing and not having the appropriate device available to be able to resuscitate the newborn. Um, sepsis, so infection. Um, so these are all preventable causes um, and all things that you know we have known interventions for that if available either um, to a midwife or a community health worker, or in this case, in a private facility, could easily sort of reduce the rates of maternal and neonatal mortality um, globally. India, in particular, unfortunately, has very high rates of maternal and neonatal mortality, and the state of Rajasthan, where the development impact bond is focused, um, has one of the highest within India. Um, and so we thought that was a particularly ripe um, state or a region within which to work. I think to your question about um, innovation and what makes us really excited about it, I think one of the things that was particularly appealing also about working in Rajasthan was the state government um, had also been actively trying to reduce rates of maternal and neonatal mortality already in Rajasthan. And one of the things that they had actually focused on was um, trying to get women to deliver in facilities. So they had actually spent a lot of time working on incentives to get women to, instead of delivering at home, deliver in facilities. Um, now, a, an interesting sort of quirk about Rajasthan or India in, in, as a whole is that public facilities to get um, insurance reimbursements actually do need to have or meet some level of um, quality accreditation standards, but private facilities do not, and so they're, they're unregulated. And so what ended up happening or what we found was when, despite the government's efforts to get women to deliver in facilities and then hopefully that would lead to the available um, drugs and, and interventions and emergency um, services that a woman might need while she's delivering or a neonate might need um, after they're born, you weren't quite seeing the big drops in maternal and neonatal mortality that you would have hoped to have seen. And subsequent follow-up studies actually found that it was the quality of care that was being delivered that might actually be sort of um, obstructing that, that reduction in, in both of those two indicators. And so one of the things that we wanted to focus on as part of this development impact bond is improving the quality of care. So what we've done is we've actually taken um, government standards around um, uh, obstetric and gynecological care, um, and we're using those to help guide sort of the, the work that our implementing partners are going to do in terms of getting private facilities up to some, up to some level of, of quality where we're confident that then the care that women and, and neonates receive when they are, um, you know, are, in, are in these facilities is actually improved. And, and as a result, then <laughs> over time, we hope to see a reduction in maternal and neonatal mortality. Great. Thank you. So one thing, you know, since I, you know, as someone who's worked on impact bonds for many years, thinking about the problems that we have in developing countries, the problems are so big that it's not necessarily going to be the kind of very focused, tiny programs that we may see in, in developed countries. We, there is a need for larger sums of money moving billions to trillions. And as often as I thought about this, my idea was that eventually this market would have to evolve to bring in more mainstream players, particularly given that service providers, when we think about NGOs, aren't going to have the balance sheet to really do something at a large scale. And what that really means is most likely these um, larger development contractors. So when I saw that Palladium was involved. It was something that I thought was very interesting. And I'd be curious, Peter, from your side, if you could talk a little bit about what Palladium's both participation means as we think about moving towards a larger scale mentality, but also maybe some of the institutional challenges that you faced within Palladium 
as a for-profit um, entity that's having to now move into a space that's um, very innovative, very new, and maybe not, let's say, high-profit core business? Sure. Uh, thanks, Zach. <coughs> so um, when, when the 2013 report came out, co-authored by CGD and Social Finance, it really spoke to the type of... Uh, the type of activities that Palladium believes in right down to its DNA. It's, it's results focused, it's private sector driven, it involves private markets, private capital, and that is something that Palladium, I mean, back 50 years ago, uh, started off as. We were a private firm uh, working in agriculture and uh, dryland farming in northern Australia, and, and uh, it, was, it was, has continued with that sort of risk-taking, almost cowboy kind of, uh, in, of approach to how we do work. I mean, it, it, we do it well, but we do take risks in order to make the most impact. And we do believe that in order to have truly sustainable impact, it's no longer a matter of grants doled out by governments or foundations. We've got to get the private capital markets involved in this. So we've invested in our own impact investment proposition, and I have been driving uh, Palladium's work in innovative finance, results-based financing, and, and the impact bonds for uh, four years now. So, I mean, pretty much as soon as, as that report came out, we're like, okay, we need to resource this. And uh, it, it was obviously, you know, it came off our, our balance sheet. It was a, a very large investment for the company to make. And even as a private contractor, bottom line is we don't make a lot of money. Uh, so it, it was a huge investment, but we saw it to be an absolute priority. It has had its institutional challenges within the company. Um, there was a long period of time when we didn't get a lot of traction. And of course, you know, I have my paymasters, or had until I spun off into my own company, much like you. Um, we, uh, you know, need to be able to meet the shareholders' commercial return expectations. And that was, uh, that continued to need to be signed off at the highest level to say, okay, well, we're going to give you that little bit of rope extra because we continue to believe and you're almost there and almost there and almost there and almost there. Uh, and really, honestly, October 29th, uh, November 29th last year, I think there was a vast amount of disbelief within Palladium uh, that this actually got off the ground because I've been saying, it'll happen, it'll happen, it'll happen for so long. Um, but, you know, they can't sustain that sort of work. So really their work is the large scale, hundreds of million dollar implementation programs. So they wanted to build the marketplace to the point where it could scale so that they could use that expertise and that scale and that operational efficiency to really contribute to that ongoing positive impact. And this is all about scale. So I think we're, we're really getting there. We've contributed, a, I think, a, a quite a deal to this space. And I, I hope now we can see the, the benefits of that. So I'm going to want to come back to, to that point exactly about scale and what it would take um, to get um, a group like Palladium more mainstream in Porter Corp business but first I want to um, you know ask UBS which has been really really much a leader in this space on um, investing in impact bonds and it would be really curious from the UBS perspective why did you guys get involved in this this project and kind of what what is your vision for how this market would need to evolve for this to to reach a larger scale what are maybe your own um, institutional challenges as we think about um, larger and larger transactions which I understand this is probably the largest impact bond you guys have invested in so far. Yeah, absolutely. Thank, thanks, Zach. Um, yeah, this is uh, the, the biggest impact bond we've done so far. Um, we've done the small pilots in the form of the Educate Girls did. This is really taking it up a level, uh, 10 times larger, and we do see it going up much bigger into a large development impact bond fund, um, probably again doing this 10 times larger. Um, so that's, that's really the vision. That's where we see it going. Um, we see a lot of interest from our clients, uh, from the bank, uh, donating money to the foundation. Um, and we see new money coming in, and I think that's very important for us. So we have the traditional grant funding that the foundation does, but increasingly we see new funding coming from clients who are really interested and triggered by this new uh, methodology, the transparency, and kind of the business thinking that our clients bring. And th they're really much more interested in doing this at a much bigger scale, and that's where we see additional funding coming in. And, and because you have that client base, is the, the choice of topic or country, is that a, a key factor in also how you're able to, to raise money? And was the, the, the specific impact bond, was that a, an important driver of your ability to, to raise that money? Absolutely. I mean, um, India, of course, is, is a very big, big country, big region. Um, naturally, we do have uh, clients from that region and a lot of clients interested in that region, uh, also from Europe, 
fr uh, from uh, the Americas. So yeah, naturally that was that was a big a big reason. Another reason I think is India is a big market. It also has a lot of capabilities, mm -hmm. local capabilities, and that is I think very important to, to when you start in this area uh, to build scale is to use those local capabilities. Excellent, excellent. So. Well, I'm, I want to keep talking about scale for, for one second. I, I want to maybe go back and talk a little bit about the project. And you guys have a slightly interesting, from what I understand, kind of measurement methodology that, that I think is not typical to, to impact bonds, which involves kind of the certification. And it's not just, oftentimes when we think about impact bonds, it's this very long-term outcome that's measured through a randomized control trial. And, and I think in this case, you guys took a it's somewhat of a pragmatic approach, and I don't know if, if anyone would like to talk about that, because for me, that thought that was very interesting, and also perhaps an innovation around balancing <coughs> pragmatism with mm -hmm. kind of um, yeah. the outcomes mindset. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I, from a development standpoint, I think that that's exactly right. We needed to be pragmatic. So, you know, one of the indicators, so what we're ultimately trying to do is, um, you know, decrease maternal and neonatal mortality in the state of Rajasthan. I think from a practical standpoint, we realized that we're not the only <coughs> Um, we're not the only game in town, right? We're not the only group that's there that's actually trying to work on this. The government themselves is actively, you know, um, in, uh, implementing their own interventions. There are other donors. USAID is also there in its own way doing its own projects. You know, so for, you know, I think one of the big things that, that one of the points that Toby made this morning was around attribution. And in this particular case, you know, direct attribution of our specific intervention to larger declines in maternal and neonatal mortality is going to be very difficult difficult to do. And so you could then argue, should we have done that? Should we have not? Maybe we can save that for a lively discussion afterwards. Um, so yes, we needed to use a proxy indicator and we needed to use sort of an, an intervention where we had kind of very strong good evidence that links improvements in quality of care to reduction in maternal and neonatal mortality. So that's all been well researched and well documented. But then needed to find a proxy outcome that we were all comfortable with and satisfied with that we could measure that, you know, we could sort of have an independent verifier come in and say yes or no, you know, this this facility has met those standards or or, you know, they are actually implementing some of the quality improvement measures that that the partners have said that they need to. And so, you know, it's it's, you know, how you know, can are we happy? Is it it's it's not maybe the ideal. But it's pretty close, and you know the fact that there is this strong link between the actual indicator and then the outcome actually that we would like to achieve, I think, makes us quite comfortable with it. Hopefully, as we become much more sophisticated in this space and in terms of you know talking about outputs versus outcomes, then you know maybe one day we'll actually be able to get to a point where we can start to really talk about solid methodology for measuring um, you know uh, changes to maternal and neonatal mortality. But for now, I think this is second best, and it's but it's it's good enough. Okay. Great. And, and you mentioned the, the government of India as well. Um, why are they not involved in this? Or why are they not providing funding? Um, in, I, I know it's um, a lot of the impact bonds I've seen now in developing countries often don't include funding from the host government. And particularly in a country like India, I'd be curious kind of to, to maybe push back on you guys and, and kind of what was the, um, what was the reasoning behind not having um, funding from the, well, think, in, the uh, government, and what was the challenge? Yeah. As I said in, in the session earlier on, I mean, it, it, they are involved. Right. Um, so they ha we, we signed, Palladium <coughs> signed an MOU with them two years ago, uh, which discussed the respective roles and responsibilities. Obviously, uh, that we operate within their ecosystem. Okay. We have to be aligned with their policies uh, and their objectives. And they have said, as part of that MOU, if we can demonstrate that this is an effective mechanism, that they will come on board uh, in a second phase after the initial three years to procure those outcomes themselves. But there are a number of issues that we need to be able to address first. There's administrative and procedural blockages within the civil service and particularly in terms of the allocation between federal and state level of annual budgets which need to be addressed. So uh, we, we need to support them, build their institutional capacity to be able to procure for outcomes, at the same time as proving that this initiative and the mechanism is actually going to drive the level of efficiency and effectiveness that we hope it will. But they are absolutely engaged. Uh, I met with them, in fact, uh, had a meeting in between Christmas and, and New Year's with them to introduce the implementation team. Uh, so, I mean, uh, they're very much engaged. In fact, it, it was with... Uh, it was with their support that we were able to bring on board, well, first of all, it was uh, Merck for Mothers, mm -hmm. uh, and then USAID, who were already very much engaged, but 
We can talk about some <coughs> procurement complexities uh, that necessitated that one-to-one -one leveraging and the particular mechanism that was used to disperse funds or will be used to disperse funds. But without the government of Rajasthan, they wouldn't have been interested. So I had been, frankly, courting the, uh, the National Health Mission and the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare uh, for a good six months before they agreed to the MOU because it does take a while to socialise this, this notion. Uh, and one of the things that they just couldn't believe was that there were actually investors who were going to come to invest in this. They were really, they were like, show us the investors. Uh, John Fairhurst, who I just saw there, the first meeting that we had uh, was in, in March 2016. And John was there with his investor's hat and they were like, oh, it's true, it's real. Uh, and then, of course, there's some, uh, some other nuances which come with utilisation of private capital. And I think it goes to, to Priya's point about where along the spectrum of the theory of change you're going to settle. Uh, investors want to have indicators which are as far, <laughs> frankly, down to the level of sort of activities that they can say this is going to impact that. We can measure, it's attributable, we want to be paid on that. Outcome funders want to go all the way up to the impact level and say, well, we're saving X amount of lives. You've got to get to a negotiated settlement somewhere along that spectrum. Uh, so uh, he brought that, that very different set of lenses. Our original conception when I first had the conversations, uh, in fact, with social finance back in 2014, was for a very broad reproductive maternal newborn child and adolescent health impact bond. And the reality is we needed to get much more focused around this. So the investor lens was a, was a very, very important one to bring to that table. It, it was difficult for the government of Rajasthan and ourselves and continues to, to be something that we are working through in terms of a, a brand new methodology. That's great, that's great. So to, to Peter's point, Cesar, is investors, are there really investors in this type of thing and, and is investment the bottleneck? And kind of from the UBS <coughs> perspective, what, did, what were your investors looking for and what did you need to prove? And, and obviously it's always this challenge between innovation and showing a track record and evidence, which you don't always have. And from you know, the UBS perspective, what was, is the investment perspective, is that the bottleneck? And as we think about this market evolving, how should we think about um, where the, the future bottlenecks would be as we start to talk about pathways to scale? Yeah, two questions there. Um, I think scale, of course, um, there is always a scale challenge, bringing in the I have, I have, to, I have to throw the word in there. <laughs> yeah, no. Absolutely. Um, a few, so a few things there. Um, one on the um, the investors. I think f uh, for us, and that's been slightly surprising in this whole process, is that our investors are actually super interested in the outcomes. Um, initially, we thought the in investors. Uh, so our investors. When I talk of investors, it's the clients that are, that are donating <coughs> funds to UBS Optimus Foundation. Uh, and we make it clear to them that those funds stay within the foundation. We don't give those funds back. We cannot do that as a foundation. So the funds stay w uh, with the foundation. But as a result, uh, clients are still very much in, uh, interested. However, what we were surprised to see is that all the clients are really, really interested to see the outcomes and to challenge us on the outcomes. So we've been giving them extensive presentations, showing them how the program works. And they've been coming in, in some cases, coming in with their own experts and challenging us on the numbers, whereas we were initially thinking, these guys are going to look at the number, they're going to see 8%, they're going to see 15%, they want to see exactly what they're going to get in terms of financial return. But it turns out that the investors are also very, very, very interested in getting the, the outcomes. And do you think that, in your experience, did that change the conversation, having those investors present around you know, accountability? Yeah, no, it's great. I mean, uh, we're really held to task. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and and it, it was... Uh, <laughs> that's what it's about, though. I mean, and, and, and our end goal is to move past the, the foundation and philanthropic capital and get to your UBS clients proper and have UBS uh, be the, the intermediary, if you like, because we want that rigor. We want that you must show us the results, you must show that you can prove that you're able to do what you do and, and then do it. Otherwise, you know, you, you kind of lose some of the, the leverage of the mechanism. So, it's, you know, this is still nascent stages, but we will get there. And maybe just ch to chime in on that. In terms of scale, we do think that uh, we have a lot of opportunity still on the philanthropic side as a foundation to really draw in a lot more philanthropic capital. So not returning the money to the end investors, uh, but still keeping it within the f foundational space. Um, there could be future additional potential in drawing in uh, commercial investors. That would not be something we would do as a foundation, but then we would look at an, into a more partnership structure with the bank itself. <coughs> But for now, we think there's a really big opportunity still within the uh, philanthropic space of really drawing in a lot more philanthropic money. I, I love the model you guys have. 
For sure. Now, Priya, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here. Okay. So, um, <laughs> I can't help myself. Go for it. USAID has, correct me with numbers here, but in the billions of dollars budget every year. To me, at least from a, just a logical standpoint, it seems pretty, you know, obvious. Well, of course it makes sense to pay for, for outcomes. Mm -hmm. I mean, who wouldn't want to pay for outcomes? Why are, are you the anomaly, or why has it taken so long for USAID to come to this point? And from your perspective, what are, are and were some of the institutional barriers that you saw, and, and what will, are those institutional barriers going forward to, to changing that mindset? Yeah. So I think it's important to remember that USAID has a long history of operating in the development space, but predominantly as a grants-based organization. So we are a traditional donor assistance agency. We're not a DFI, so you know we don't operate like a like an IMF or a World Bank. You know our primary way of working is by dispersing grants, and and for the most part, that will continue to be the way that we we operate. I think to the question about why we haven't sort of previously or maybe as you know historically paid for outcomes, I think we could throw that question out to other donors as well and kind of say, why have we not? And pr probably the short answer is because it's really difficult, right? As we're all finding out now, as we're kind of wading into this murky water of pay, pay for results, it is really hard to do. Um, it is a lot easier and we're much more comfortable saying, look, we, we want to improve the quality of care in private facilities in Rajasthan, we're going to pay somebody to do it and we're going to disperse the funding based on inputs because that's that's what we know how to do and we're, we're very good at it. And as you said, you know, the way that we're set up, you know, really lends itself to that type of operating. I think one of the challenges that we're facing, and it's not just USAID, I think the development assistance space as a whole is, is facing some of these challenges, is that the, the world is changing. The development finance landscape is shifting. Right? The fact that we're sitting at a UBS um, office right now having this discussion about impact bonds in the development space is a testament to the fact that the landscape is shifting. It's not just traditional donors, bilaterals, multilaterals in this space. We have interest from private investors that are coming in to actually do something good with the funds that they have. So yes, they want money back, but they're also very happy to take a lower return if there is some social impact or to donate their money to a foundation to have that social impact and not see a return on that investment. Um, you know, so so that's that's sort of one large trend that we're seeing. The other one is that countries themselves, you know, there's this has been, you know, over the last few years we've seen huge macroeconomic growth in many of the countries that we work in. And USAID in some countries is now kind of a, a small share of overall funding to to many sectors, including health. And so we find ourselves in a very interesting position of, you know, still having a seat at the table, but maybe less money as an overall share of the pie. And so what we're starting to, to need to do is think about how we operate differently. How do we interact with these new partners? So, right, so they're partners now. This is another kind of evolution. It's not just a traditional sort of donor and recipient relationship. We have partners now. So how do we how do we engage in that partnership and how do we use the existing resources that the resources that we have most efficiently and effectively to achieve these outcomes to achieve these results that we're all looking to achieve and so I think that's been a huge sort of driving force you know over the last few years so you know I've been at USAID now for five years in this innovative financing space and you know I think over the last couple of years have seen huge acceleration internally and huge momentum around kind of shifting and, and looking more towards innovative financing and, and pay for results as kind of a new way of operating. It will by no means sort of take over and change the agency's way of working, but I think one of the things that we're trying to do is think a little bit more systematically and strategically about when different types of innovative financing or pay for results type mechanisms could be more appropriate than a traditional grant-based approach. Um, to your question about institutional barriers and bottlenecks, I mean, I think a lot of us were surprised by how few we actually did face trying to get this development impact bond up and running. Um, it, it, so it was by no means the easiest process. I will grant everybody that. But it was not nearly as hard as everybody, and I think the panelists, including, thought it would be. Right? And, and so it was shocking to, to say we actually do have the ability to work in a different way. We just haven't previously flexed those muscles right? because we, we know one way of working. We're very good at it. That's sort of the traditional way of operating. So you know, we have you know, wonderful people that work in our office of procurement. We have wonderful lawyers that were you know, fully bought in, drunk the Kool-Aid on this pay for results thing, and we're very excited to, to be able to help us make this a reality. I think the largest institutional challenge that we face is this cultural shift. You know, we have people that have been at the agency for a very, very, very long time um, doing excellent work. I mean, you know, again, the fact that we're talking about the shifting landscape and 
you know, huge changes in, in macroeconomic situations for our countries is a testament to that work that's been done today. Um, but, you know, it's, it's very hard to get a large bureaucracy with all of these people that are used to one way of working to think in a different way. And so I think for us, that's really going to be the biggest challenge, and that's where we're going we're gonna to have to do the most work right now is to bring, bring people on board. We certainly have pockets throughout the agency and at the country level where we work, um, but, you know, bringing everybody on board, that's going to take real leadership, um, and, you know, I think we have that. You know, certainly this is a priority with this administration, and so it'll be exciting to see, you know, how that, how that happens over the next four years. Well, wow. now, I'm, now I'm double jealous, both for, for this project, <laughs> but also now hearing that you had a very easy, smooth relationship with your legal and procurement teams, which, well, was, which was not my experience necessarily. I, well, I, I, think, I think one lesson learned, um, and our lawyer will be the first to tell you this, is that we need to bring them in earlier. Yeah. Um, I think if we had done that, it probably would have been even faster and even better. Um, but I think that's certainly a lesson learned for next time. For sure. And, and, I, and I think you, you make a great point in that this is a change in mindset. Absolutely. And it's hard. Yep. It, you know, in my experience, it is a hard, long process. And sometimes that change in mindset is not easy. But it doesn't mean it's not worth doing. It, precisely. Now, here's a, a question maybe for you, Peter, and I know you have some thoughts on this. What can we do as we think about, you know, a sector or a market that's going to be evolving and maybe not today or tomorrow but you know within the next five years what can really be done as we think more maybe systemically <laughs> to make that process easier for for governments for investors um as you think about the scale yeah i mean uh, going back again to, to that seminal uh, social finance and, and uh, cgd uh, report of, of 2013 one of the clear recommendations of uh, building the marketplace for scale was that outcome funders, governments, donors, needed to address their own policy procedure on cultural barriers to procuring for outcomes. And um, USAID has, is very proactive in this space. So I was at an incubator in, in November, um, which was, uh, was put on uh, by the Centre for Accelerating Innovation in, in, in Health, as well as uh, what they call E3, I think, the, the economic growth people. Uh, and it was really about, okay, how can we take the lessons of particularly uh, the Utkrish design and structuring process and make recommendations to Administrator Green to the, to the front office uh, on addressing those barriers. And there's, there's uh, talk, nascent still, and maybe you know, but, uh, setting up a fund and, and addressing institutional strengthening and, and potential recipients, having co-design processes. More donor agencies need to do that. Um, so Diffid has, has started now as well, Radna and, and Jessica, they're here, um, they're now addressing those, but uh, you saw with the uh, Uganda Sleeping Sickness Impact Bond, I mean, they uh, funded a very interesting piece of work against social finance, um, and uh, the design was fantastic, but it was very time bound, and the, the, uh, the quantum of funds needed was very large, and they just could not procure it. They couldn't sole source it, they couldn't put it out to an open tender, and so what was going to be an amazing piece of work uh, never got off the ground. So that's my big, honestly, the, the biggest thing. We've, we've got to ask the outcome funders, whatever they look like, whether they're recipient governments, whether they're donors, whether they're foundations, whether they're corporates using CSR and sustainability funds, they need to gear up for a completely new way of procuring. And, and part of that, of course, is very strongly working. I, I don't think dibs are a thing. I think SIBs are a thing. Right. That's where we want to head. So it's really about providing the institutional strengthening technical assistance to the governments who are going to eventually be the outcome funders so they can do this. That's, I think, going to be the real key. No, I, I couldn't agree 100%. I, could, I agree 100%. And, you know, we're actually, I'm working with a group called Up Social right now in, um, on Impact Bond in Europe. And we just started talking to the government. And the first thing we're trying to get our heads around is procurement. And it's the least sexy issue but it's one of those things that it's it drives so everything else yeah. so i before i wrap up there's one last kind of question i want to pose for you guys which is i'm a big believer in, in ecosystems and enabling ecosystems and when we worked in latin america on impact bonds we start we started by mapping out and targeting countries where we thought there was an enabling ecosystem where you had social enterprises and impact investors I, is it a coincidence and maybe i can ask this to ubs that the first dibs are in are in india you did your the I guess the Educate Girls did, but you have this did. I believe you maybe you're looking at others. Is there a reason why we're seeing this activity in India, or is it just coincidence? I think uh, I think that definitely is. I mean, uh, like I said, to, said earlier, there there is a much bigger uh, amount of local expertise already present. Um, that lowers costs. Um, there is a much bigger potential for scale. 
um, if we were to look at doing something, for example, in West Africa, where we have much smaller countries, uh, weaker governments, uh, far less uh, organizations on the ground, probably uh, very, very few homegrown organizations on the ground. Whereas in India, there are a lot of homegrown organizations on the ground with excellent people. Um, and, that's, and that's much more relevant than uh, trying to fly in people at a much higher cost level. So getting started in a market like India is, is, is makes a lot of sense for us. And have you seen, because of the, those, those first dips that you've done, that other local actors are now starting to, to get involved that may not have been involved beforehand? So I'll pass that question on to, to Peter, because yeah. he has and a bit more exposure to those local <laughs> partners. <laughs> very happy to say absolutely. Okay. So uh, big banks, ICICI, Yes Bank, um, and uh, a number of others, uh, even Grameen Capital, looking at it. So without doubt, um, there's an Impact Investing Council of India. It's making representations to uh, the Federal uh, Treasury um, to be able to address some of the, again, the, the sort of policy institutional issues, uh, providing tax breaks, uh, and, and uh, you know, there's a, there's a huge upswell. Um, who, who uh, COIS uh, has uh, just uh, set up office in Mumbai. Um, uh, Charles Antoine, uh, who, uh, who else is really active um, there? I think Dahlberg has an office there. Mm -hmm. and Palladium, uh, of course, uh, has, has a number of offices there. So without doubt, India is an incredibly exciting place and, and as Sita says, absolutely suited to this. Um, they also have, uh, frankly, a crazy appetite for innovation, you know, um, doing things not the way things are done. It's one of the, if I can say, hallmarks of the, of the country. Um, so it, it's totally suited. And Rajasthan particularly, just very forward-leaning government, um, already had institutionalised uh, new PPP legislation mm -hmm. in the health sector. Um, and so, yeah, and also, let's not forget the, the importance of the champion. So uh, the Secretary for Health, Naveen Jain, uh, has been uh, an amazing champion for this uh, initiative. And, uh, well, it's absurd to, to say anything else, but it, it could never have happened without him. So I could sit up here and ask you guys questions for at least another hour, but I, I'm sure many of you guys in the audience have questions. So, you know, let's open it up to the floor and, and you know, please, you know, feel free to ask provocative, um, challenging questions. Um, more challenging, the better. Uh, Mikael. Hi, uh, Mikael from Mark Social in, in Spain. I wanted to ask you what the reason why you use a social impact bond for this specific project, and then, and then in general, if you can, is it to somehow illustrate the number of interventions, preventative interventions work and therefore need to be mainstreamed afterwards by public private actors? Or is it a way of a, a sort of a, me a permanent mechanism for delivering preventive uh, interventions in an area where you know, there is a big epidemic? Mm -hmm. what, what's the real purpose of it? Or is it a different way? So, um, I, I'm often criticised for my uh, over uh, exuberance when it comes to candour. And uh, so, um, frankly, um, when, when I started uh, heading up Palladium's work in this space, um, we were highly motivated to build the marketplace. And so we scanned our portfolio of uh, programmes, uh, which span across 94 countries, and we looked for activities that we were either implementing or had recently implemented, which bore many of the hallmarks of a results-based financing mechanism, which could then evolve into an impact bond style uh, mechanism. And we, we had been working in, uh, well, initially in Uttar Pradesh and Uttarakhand, and more recently in Bihar and Odisha uh, around a very similar program. And the most recent one, uh, Project Ujwal, was already 100% milestone uh, payment based. So we knew that it, was, it had a high potential to be able to evolve into something that we could, uh, we could phrase as, as an impact bond. Um, the intervention itself, however, lent itself perfectly to, to the model uh, as it evolved. And as I said, it, had, it bore no real relationship to what we initially uh, designed back in, in 2014. Um, so now it's really a matter of having a, it is that second uh, part of the equation. It's about institutionalizing it within not just Rajasthan, but the government of India to be able to have this preventive focus, uh, particularly in, in MNH, but more broadly in RMNCH plus A and in other, not just in other areas of the health sector, but in other sectors altogether. 
So the, the vision is, is really large. I'll just add to that really quickly. So I, I, I agree with all of that. I think the, the other interesting thing that lends itself nicely for an impact bond is this flexibility that the partners will have to be able to do what they need to do to work with the different facilities to get them up to that certain level of quality of care that we're looking for, right? So, you know, we could be prescriptive about it and that's typically, you know, maybe how USAID would work by saying you're going to deliver training and you're going to kind of do uh, monitoring and evaluation and, and observation and then put together a plan and, and that's how we would, you know, maybe procure this out traditionally. But here what we're saying is, you know, as long as these facilities meet that, that specific level that we're looking for, you do whatever it is within certain parameters that we need you to do to be able to get, to get these facilities up to that specific level. Some are going to already be really close and going to require less intervention. Some are going to be a lot farther away and are going to need more help. And what that help looks like will vary. Is it an urban facility versus peri-urban versus rural? Do they even have the basic staff that they need and are they looking at starting to work on staffing up first or maybe improvements in training and continuing education? So what you know, what's nice about the impact bond model is that they can innovate. Our partners can innovate and do what they need to do and be as flexible as they need to be to be able to achieve those results. And then we don't also have to do kind of the work that UBS does, which is nice, uh, kind of making sure that the partners are actually doing what they need to do, right? So we can, we can step back a little, which is maybe a different way for us working um, as, you know, not having as much direct contact with the implementing partners to say, what are you doing? How is it going? Checking in regularly. We've sort of outsourced that to, to the, you know, UBS Optimus <coughs> Foundation, which, you know, is also, it's nice for us. <laughs> Please. It's, it's, it's a combination of both. So we, we have uh, quite a few clients that are, are very engaged w with the foundation, um, that have been supporting multiple programs, it's been giving us uh, funds that we basically grant out to the various programs we support. Um, some of those clients have been, I think, converted into uh, funding divs, um, but also uh, we see new clients coming in, and that's the interesting, interesting part because. So that's a kind of additionality when well, you launch something like this. Exactly, and that's why we've also decided to, 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 to kind of grow this part of our portfolio to, to, to really try to increase the amount of, of funding that we can put towards the development sector. Yeah. Thank you. I think the, the gentleman in the back w was first. You. Uh, Arvanusa from Novartis Social Business. I'm aware that uh, this might open a can of worms, but um, we like I that. still want to, <laughs> want to hear a little bit more about the outcome evaluation about the difficulties that you've encountered so that I can also learn from that. Mm -hmm. So we haven't started yet, um, but you know, I, I think you know, as, as Zach was saying, it's not, it's not a randomized controlled trial. Mm -hmm. right? So what we're doing is we've, you know, we have a third party independent evaluator who will be going in and they've actually proposed their own methodology for how they're going to kind of decide what trigger payments and what doesn't. Um, <coughs> so, you know, it's, it's, it is still in, a, in and of itself a relatively sophisticated um, model, but, you know, I think the larger question you're asking is around accreditation and then the achievement of sort of what we're claiming, which is reduction in, in maternal and neonatal mortality. So, you know, one of the things that we've been discussing since, since we're all together um, in the same city for a change, which is nice, is looking at an impact evaluation to actually sort of evaluate the entire development impact bond process. So not just the specific verification of results, but maybe you know, potentially doing something longer term. So this particular impact bond, it's a three-year pilot. I think to really be able to determine whether it's been successful and whether we've actually achieved the outcomes that we would like to achieve, we're probably going to have to do something a little bit longer. Um, and you know, I think in principle, that's something that we're all you know, interested in. And, and certainly from you know, the donor outcomes funder perspective, I think the big question I get all the time, and it's very relevant to this conversation, is scale. What is it going to take for USAID to do more? And quite frankly, it's doing more of these impact evaluations and having that evidence to be able to say, not only is it a new way of working that fits nicely with you know, 
sib, you know, dib to sib, and so then we're talking about, you know, getting countries on that path to self-reliance and transitioning off of donor assistance, but then also being able to really point to, look, we actually achieved the results that we're going, that we said we were going to achieve. We did it cheaper, right? So that's that's one thing that we've been talking about: cost efficiencies, effectiveness, um, better use of donor funding, and transparency. Can we actually make all of these claims, you know, five, ten, fifteen <coughs> years later, and actually prove out prove out the model? And so. Um, we don't have the, the perfect answer yet, but I think we're all on the same page that these are things and these are the right questions that we need to, even amongst the partnership, needs to keep pushing on and figuring out how we actually get those answers. I think the woman next to you had a question. Hey, my name is Amy Williams from Kids Training Finance, and my question goes to Julia Foundation. Uh, you were talking about an investment. Is it technically an investment for you, or is it a donation? I mean, you mentioned your clients. As far as I understood, they donate the money and then it's gone. For you, in legal terms, can you call this an investment or is it also a donation? That's a very good question. And uh, I think there's, um, as we are a foundation, of course, we have certain limitations as to what we can do legally. And this is also an area that we are uh, expanding. Um, if, you, if you look at, the, for example, the UK, yeah, and, and foundation law, it's, it's, it's a lot broader than we have in Switzerland. Switzerland is, is a much smaller market, and not only that, it's also split by canton, so you have can the, your cantonal regulators. Just taking a, a step back from that, that is something we, we, we are uh, looking at, and we are engaging the cantonal authorities all the time to see within the interpretation of, of Swiss law, what can we do and what, what can we, um, where can we invest and how can we ensure that that money, of course, stays within the uh, <coughs> philanthropic area, which is, which is very important for us. I mean, the money we invest in this DIB comes back to the foundation and is available for reinvestment into the next DIB. So from that perspective, we see it as an investment. Um, from the client's perspective, this is a donation to the foundation. They give their money. Um, the money gets invested in, into this program, comes back out, and then is ready for reinvestment. And the client has us has a say over where that um, money will go. So we take into account their views on that. So if, the way we position it towards our clients is this is a, a recurring investment where you can uh, grow your, your philanthropic <coughs> funding over time and position it into various results-based funding instruments. Um, I guess the gentleman in, way in the back. Uh, I have two questions. The first question is about um, uh, who is paying what and when in this model. Yeah. If you can say that. Uh, the other question is about sustainability. Uh, as Tony mentioned in his presentation, no UK SIP has continued after 10 contracts. So in your uh, socialization with the government of Pakistan, uh, uh, their engagement <coughs> goes because the ultimate goal is for this to be continued by the through government uh, funding. The government would like to, s to wait until, uh, to see this is working or not, uh, using your money, right? And then if it's successful, then they will start shipping and continue this, uh, this model uh, using their own domestic resources. So, so what about sustainability in this, in this case and, 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 and the commitment from the government uh, just allowing it to, sh to happen or there is no fair commitment should I start on the yeah, flows well, and yeah. then pass on the sustainability? Yeah, perfect. Um, so, uh, just to give a, a brief outline of how the financial flows will work. So, we will uh, kick off this program really soon. Um, what will happen is that UBS will put forward the working capital. So, we're putting uh, forward three million uh, US dollars. This th this funding will start off. Uh, will basically will basically pay Palladium. Palladium will take these funds and contract the service providers and get them started on the interventions. In the meantime, as the program starts running, the independent verifier will start verifying on a half yearly basis are the actual outcomes being achieved. They report back to the consortium 
Um, and once uh, USAID and Merck get these results in, based on the, the formula that we have agreed, they will then pay UBS Optimus Foundation. So we are the central conduit. We receive the outcome funds uh, once the outcomes are being achieved. But we, we start off the program by pre-funding the program. Probably like another hour or two, but <laughs> we're, we're, we're just getting warmed yeah. up. Exactly. Yeah, but yeah. Right. Uh, just some headline numbers. So we are uh, funding up to three three million U.S. dollars in terms of working capital. The outcome funds in total are eight million U.S. dollars, um, and the, the return we we estimate in the base case is eight percent, which flows back to the foundation. So eight percent over the three million. So um, I mean. Uh, Fortuitously, that uh, has, has now lobbed uh, the ball over to my court, and I can talk about two of what I think are some of the cooler uh, aspects of an already cool uh, mechanism. We, uh, and I say we, the implementation partners, so Palladium, and uh, both of our service provider partners, Population Services International, PSI, and HLFPPT, Hindustan Latex Family Planning Partnership Trust. It is a mouthful. We're investors as well. We're co-investors. So we're putting up 20% of, well, slightly more, but anyway, uh, of that risk capital as well. So we stand to uh, lose out if we don't meet the target as well. This was seen as a really nifty way of aligning risk and reward all the way through the mechanism. So that was really cool. And I think, I think Zach, you've done something similar but not quite at that scale in, in one of yours as well. It was a painful negotiation. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we, uh, so um, that, that's one thing. And, and that, that, I think, should become more of the norm in the future. Uh, now, to, to the point about sustainability, that really is one of the coolest <laughs> things about this. It is about transitioning this externally fu funded uh, piece of work to being embedded within the government of Rajasthan. Will it be exactly the same set of activities? I don't think so. I think it's going to evolve as we go through the program, and it will be something which looks more at the... Uh, emerging priorities of the government of Rajasthan. But what we're doing is building the institutional capacity and the frameworks, the legislative frameworks, uh, the governance, for them to be able to take this, uh, the mechanism rather than necessarily the exact set of activities into the future. <coughs> Does that make sense, Hatham? Absolutely. Oh. Uh, Frank Tuis uh, from Global Affairs. So, um, Global Affairs Canada. Uh, just wondering about the, uh, in terms of collecting the initial baseline data, mm -hmm. how do you ensure that there's reliability there and how do you all agree to that? Mm -hmm. So do, do you want me to take yeah, first go, go bite ahead. of that? Yeah. So um, what we're doing, the, the success criteria is about the facilities meeting certain quality standards. There's two sets of these standards. One is based upon, well, not based upon, one is from the NABH, National Accreditation Board for Hospitals, Small Healthcare Organizations, Entry Level Certification. And that is very much around process and um, infrastructure. So really about standard operating procedures, ensuring appropriate signage, access, waste management. The other set of standards is from the Federation of Obstetrical and Gynecological Societies of India, FOGSI. They've just launched something called Manyata. And that is very much more around clinical behaviours. So these two sets of standards combined, uh, in our theory of change, will have the improvement in quality that will lead to the impact level uh, outcome. So the baseline is in fact set by uh, the service providers going in and doing that initial quality assessment. We've already done that as part of uh, convergence funding. Of course, you know convergence. Global Affairs Canada uh, funds them in, uh, to the majority. They're a fantastic uh, world's first blended finance program. Hugely grateful to them for their support. They funded us to do an initial uh, mapping of private health facilities in 10 districts in Rajasthan, and then to do a quality assessment in those that we uh, judged as eligible. So we have certain, we have 10 eligibility criteria for the facilities, uh, minimum number of births per month, uh, minimum staffing levels, uh, registration with uh, the, uh, the waste management authorities. So we did that quality assessment there and that became the basis for uh, our, our costing, uh, for the outcome metrics, unit cost, for uh, the, the very approach that, or rather approaches. We're having a or sort of a, a mini uh, competition, if you like, 
having two different service providers with two different approaches, which we'll both learn from and then inform one another through this adaptive implementation. Uh, so again, when we start off, it's going to be about uh, the service providers, uh, first of all mapping their universe, and second of all doing the quality assessment, which will then be uh, done, uh, will then be measured. We, we've developed a, a uh, performance management system uh, with the assistance uh, or contracting of Scott Konung and Instiglio. Uh, and they, uh, that will track on a real-time basis their improvement along the, uh, the, both of those sets of quality standards up until the point where they, we judge them uh, and the service providers judge them to have met those standards, at which stage we say, yep, they're good to go. And then the independent verification agency comes in with the stamp uh, of approval or not. Um, so not quite answering your question, because I mean, I think you're really talking about impact uh, baseline, which, well, there's an SRS, uh, the uh, sample registration system uh, collection, uh, which measures NMR and MMR. It was just uh, published uh, in the last month or two. Uh, latest figures are from 2016. Robust enough, uh, yeah, it's difficult to tell. I mean, essentially, the data that Toby mentioned this morning, availability of robust enough data, is a question mark, particularly in emerging economies. So um, that's why we want to have a separate impact evaluation, which will address, I think, your points precisely. I hope that <laughs> <laughs> responds enough. And we have time for maybe one more question. OK, you were the, the last question. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm Robin Del Sandra from the Vital Foundation. And we've looked at this and put it up to our board. And they believe that on a case-by-case -case basis, we could be both risk investors and outcomes payers. Um, the OBS model, and this is for both of you, including Priya, uh, USAID. Uh, the OBS model, I appreciate because it's a foundation, it's more philanthropy with an upside. And we are only able to be angel investors anyway. We can't take equity in anything. So that's fine for us. But what we realized when we started talking to colleagues is that we could have syndicated this multiple times over if there was a real chance for an upside that wasn't just philanthropic. And I just wondered how you see that evolving, especially as if we want to take this to scale down the road. Um, you will need other players than the philanthropic players, mm -hmm. as we know, probably two trillion a year to meet the SDGs. So if we're looking for those many multiples, do you see it evolving into more of a commercial vehicle? Uh, yes, um, but with caution. Um, we, we definitely think that, that there, is, there is a pathway to getting more commercial investors mm -hmm. in there. Um, but I think we need to proceed very, very carefully on that path. Um, this is still a very new structure. Uh, there is a lot of skepticism. Um, a lot of people are not comfortable with the concept of returning funds to private investors. So we need to, to look at how to do that. Um, and also, I think what will be important there is to, to, to separate the, the role of a foundation there to the role of the bank. So if we, we indeed proceed down that road, we would need to make it very, very clear as to what is the foundation's role in this and what is the bank's role in this. Um, and you could, we could imagine uh, doing a, mo a more blended structure where there is, a, there is a, um, a first loss, for example, being taken by the commercial investors um, and having different tranches. But optics are really, really, really important here and we need to be extremely careful um, in, in going down that road. So we, uh, we eventually probably will go down that road, but we need to be extremely cautious. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think just, just to add to that, I think that's the right approach, baby steps. This is still a relatively new model, certainly in the development space, and a lot of that evidence that we need is missing. Um, it's very much a partnership effort, so I think, you know, one of the things that, you know, after two some years of working on this, and I get no credit for the majority of those years, um, this really is a partnership. Everybody is in it, and success really is... Yes, it, it's written into contracts, but certainly I think there's, you know, on a personal level, everybody's really been invested in this, and that's personal, but then also at um, kind of respective organizational level. So having that trust and that partnership is, is really critical, and I think, you know, ultimately I would like to see true sort of private investment come in where, you know, of the kind that we've been talking about, it's maybe UBS and not UBS Optimus Foundation, but I think at the outset, while we're still trying to figure out what this looks like and, and how this works in the development space, having that mission alignment, right, having that kind of 
almost that's that safe space to know that UBS Optimist Foundation isn't just in it for the upside, but really to drive social change, which is why we're in it, is is really critical. So I'm happy to have you know some you know return given back to UBS Optimist Foundation, knowing that that's going to get recycled for other mission-driven projects. Um, and certainly that's the model that we're trying to prove, but then also knowing really that it is about that social impact first, and then second, that financial return, I think gives me comfort knowing that they're gonna do a good job to make this as successful as possible, but then also makes it an easier sell for me internally, and it comes back to that chain, that cultural change. You know, it's easier to sell a foundation as, an, as a pri private investor than it is to sell, you know, UBS, the investment firm, or, you know, an insurance company, or, you know, an investment bank, and so, you know, until we become much more sophisticated and have more experience and evidence to point to, I think baby steps with like-minded organizations is really critical. Great. So I think that, that we'll, we'll wrap up there. I'd like to both thank the panelists can and congratulate. Um, well, can I, last word. Well, I, it would be remiss of me um, to, to not mention uh, a number of organizations who aren't represented up here. So, of course, um, Merck for Mothers um, are the co-outcome funder. Um, so in, obviously integral to, to the process, but social finance contributed to the design and structuring. Uh, Scott Koning was doing in our, our informatics side of things, and Stiglio's contributing to the performance management. Reed Smith did the structuring, some of which was pro bono for us. Um, Phoenix Legal in, in India was working with us. I had uh, tax advice from ATL in India, of course the government of Rajasthan. Sambodhi in, uh, in India also contributed to the early thinking around measurement. Uh, and Mathematica is going to be, or is, uh, the uh, independent verification agency. So it's really, I mean, to, to Priya's point about a partnership, uh, you know, a cast of thousands, yeah. many, many, many people have actually fallen by the wayside. Um, there have been births, deaths and marriages. Um, but here we are, and, and now it's getting down to the real business of implementation. And that's, a, I think, a great point to leave on. I think for, for those of you who are new to social impact bonds, what Peter just described is both the beauty and the, I guess, what gives you more gray hairs. It takes a village. It, yeah. take, yeah. it takes it a village. But I'd like to, to thank the panelists. Great panel, but also great initiative. Thank you. Thank you. And congratulations and good luck to Peter on his new initiative. It's, <laughs> it's good to see a, a contemporary taking the plunge as well.